I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Siren Podcast. Joining me today is a man who really needs no introduction. If you've been on the pool deck and you've been a swimmer, you've seen him. He's the guy carrying the camera. He is the chief photographer for Swim Swam News, Swim Swam Magazine, Swim Swam Everything. He gets it done in a dramatic fashion. Today, we are talking to Jack Spitzer. What's up, buddy? What's up? What's up, Gold Medal Mel? This is the one thing that I have I have not liked about the pandemic, and that is that I have not traveled with you and been stuck in a room sleeping on a cot while you take the bed and snore through the night. Isn't that your favorite memory ever from a, a swim meet nationals in 2019 at Stanford? It was, it was a was great, it was a great way to fully experience Jack Spitzer and I'm giving you a hard time, but the truth is, um, you know, I also got a peek inside your world. I understand how hard it is to be a photographer. I know it's, 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 a, it's not an easy gig. You're carrying gear, try to carry your gear through hot summer sessions, prelims, and finals, staying in between, constantly loading media. It is, it's, it's a hard gig. So if anyone wants to really do this, it's not just being passionate about what you're capturing. It's also, you have to have a lot of resilience in terms of work. Um, fair statement? Yep. And I think I, I learned well from being a distance swimmer. It's just a lot of nonstop heavy lifting. It is a lot. And it, sweating and being tired all day. <laughs> you're a smart guy. You're a go-getter. You're also the CEO of Epic Drone Tours, which if anybody's on Instagram, um, they, need to be, they, need to be, they need to get that. They need to be following you. So drop all your Instagram handles for us right now so people will know where to follow you. I've got three. One is just at Jack Spitzer and then Spitzer Photo for all things photography and then Epic Drone Tours. Epic Which, Drone Tours is the most impressive thing I've ever seen. You actually took the Epic Drone and did it at a, at a, at a I guess, a, an inner squad meet or some meet. And that was kind of crazy looking. And uh, no, but you're, you're a talented entrepreneur. And uh, for anybody out there that's listening, they, and, you know, a lot of our advertising partners know this, but you, you are a contractor. You own your own business. And as is customary with news organizations, we license your work you own it so you own what you have and we have an editorial license and uh and that's a part of how you grow your business and your go-getter early on you said hey mel um you know i have certain milestones i want to hit and i want to capture the olympic games you started talking about these years out um so tell me about what your expectations were saying hey mel i want to go to the olympic games and how that changed after going to the Olympic games? Um, I mean, I think that when I was planning for it or like thinking about it, it kind of was this big lofty goal that I didn't think would kind of happen that quick. It was supposed to be right away in 2020, which would have been less than two years after working with you guys, which was kind of crazy to me. Um, I think the expectations were pretty, pretty similar to what I thought would happen, but you know, after getting there and experiencing it, especially during COVID, um, it kind of wasn't anything that I, it exceeded my expectations 10 times with how amazing it was being on that deck and in that atmosphere and just being able to, to witness what the entire world was watching. We're going to unpack all of that. So we, we, hopefully this is sort of like a day in the life of Jack Spitzer at the Olympic Games. It's, it's a, you're a photographer. This is a lofty goal. This is this is a you know it's the biggest stage and sport in 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 swimming. Um, but to get to go from the United States to the to the pool deck in Tokyo, not an easy lift. Uh, what was that? What was that travel like from Los Angeles to Tokyo? Yeah, that was probably the hardest part of the entire journey. Was getting not even getting to Tokyo, just getting on the plane in LA because of COVID. Um, well, first it was my first time ever going out of the country. So I had to learn about customs and immigration and all that. But the, and I actually, I, I'm not gonna lie, I did things a little bit 
last minute as far as COVID tests. I thought we were just going to get simple COVID tests until I looked at the fine print and started to realize, no, this isn't just typical COVID tests from UCSD that I've been doing. Um, so there was about 10 different criteria that the specific certificate form that we had to have, that it needed to have on it. And I called about 15, probably 15 different places in San Diego. And they were like, nope, ours doesn't say that. And finally, I found one in La Jolla that said, oh, yeah, the whole U.S. skateboard and surf team um, used us because they are from San Diego and Orange County. And it was $500 per test. We needed two of them within three and five days of leaving. And each one was 500 bucks. So it was $1,000 in COVID tests just to leave. Um, and in addition to that, we, because with the IOC, we had to make a 14 day plan two weeks out of leaving where we had to say exactly where we'd be on each day at the Olympic games so that they could track where we were. Um, and in addition to that, there was just about a dozen different forms we had to sign saying that we would stay in the venue or in our hotel. We wouldn't go anywhere else. We wouldn't go out in public until two weeks. Um, so it was just a lot of different, a lot of, lots of paperwork we had to, to submit. And even when I got to the airport in LA, they gave me trouble because they thought that my COVID test was on the wrong date or something. But yeah, that was just getting on the plane. And then I had a huge plane that can probably seat three or 400 people, basically to myself. There were six of us and there were 15 flight attendants. So was, that was kind of cool. And once we arrived there, it was then eight hours from landing in Tokyo until I got to my hotel because we had to submit all the paperwork and then we had to get COVID tested there and wait in quarantine for three hours. And then they took us to a central spot in the middle of Tokyo where we then went from there to our hotel. So by the time all of that happened, it was about eight hours until I was finally in my hotel room. So from, and, la from landing to your hotel room, eight hours. You're right. After in total, that, total was about 20, 22 to 24 hours from leaving LA. I think I've taken that flight a few times. Is it a nine and a half hour flight? It was 10 and a half. 10 and a half hours. Sorry about that. 10 and a half hour flight, then eight more hours. And then you're, you land and Braden Keith and Mel Stewart are blowing up your phone. Where are the photos? How soon yep. do you get to the venue? The pressure's on. And that's also, that, that's also an added pressure. And, and another added pressure was that, you know, you had booked your hotel and then had to change your hotel because of the COVID restrictions. You go through this long odyssey getting there and traveling. And you, an, another pressure is, is, is the, the Mel Stewart and Braden Keith. And then all the social media managers, everyone starts saying, Jack, give me, give me, give me. How long before you squeezed off that first shot? Um, so I got to the hotel at about 10 or 11 p.m. And the ceremony was the next day. So I slept for probably... So I slept for the most. I've slept that entire trip was, uh, as I think, about six hours. And then I got up and caught the first uh, 6 a.m. bus to the media center. So it was a main press center, which is kind of the hub for all media, photographers, writers, everybody. Um, and that is where I went to validate my credential and pick up tickets to the ceremony. Because in addition to having our credential, we had to have tickets for all of the high demand events because not all photographers or writers were allowed there. So I think it was the ceremony, swimming, basketball, gymnastics, and track and field. <clears throat> um, and of course there was long lines there. And we also had to get COVID tested there because we had to be tested every single day in order to have access to the deck at events. Um, so I went there, spent about four or five hours there, and then went from the press center to the main transport center because there's a separate two. So you had to go from the transport center to the main press center, then back to the transport center. And then from there, I went to the ceremony and I got there at about four or 5 p.m. Um, and that's when I started first taking shots of the Olympic Stadium, which is where track events were and the ceremony. And it's just to let people understand this. So we have a full unpacking of, of your experience. What, what is your daily commute like back and forth hotel at the pool? Oh, it was awful. So if I'm taking the bus, the, so they had a whole busing system set up um, where they have that main transport mall. And from there, buses deploy out to all the hotels and all the venues. And at the, the first couple of days, it was a lot worse because they were figuring it out. But 
once you got to the bu- to each bus stop, whether you're at the venue or at the transport mall, it was about 40 minutes. And then all the venues were super spread out between Tokyo. So each drive was anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes, um, except for surfing, which was a two and a half hour bus ride, but I didn't go to that. Um, so in the morning I would get up and get the bus at either 6.30 or seven. And then now I would get to the pool at about eight, which was about two and a half hours before the session started so that I could get a good spot. Um, so it was about a two hour commute anywhere I wanted to go. I, I think everybody gets an idea. They're, they're not going to cry for you too much. They're just <laughs> going to go. That was tough. That was hard. But then there's uh, just a curiosity from my point of view. It's uh, I, I know you're an artist. I know, you know, in addition to being an entrepreneur, you really care about what you do and the quality of the shots that you take. Did you, did you feel, did you have that moment of doubt? You know, it's, did you, did you think, okay, I've got to take really great images or were you frazzled and just started, you know, firing off shots? No, I mean, I think that since I'm still so young, I was in photography heaven. So I was like, holy crap, I'm in Tokyo. And at the Olympics, like I never had a doubt. I was like, there's always going to be something somewhere that I can shoot, even if it's just warm up while I'm waiting, uh, you know, before a session or Tokyo driving over the rainbow bridge, looking at the rings on the water. Like there's, there was something to capture everywhere for any reason. Um, and I was kind of just starstruck the whole time. That reminds me, we don't have a lot of just general uh olympic stock where's my general olympic stock you got a bunch from the ceremony which is funny so my biggest mistake of the entire week was i don't really remember watching past olympic games at least the ceremony because i thought that after the parade it was just over and so i was sitting through this long olympic parade um and it was going on for hours i was sweating because in tokyo it was about 100 degrees and full humidity I was sweating. I thought I was going to pass out. So I was like, I'm just going back. And then one of my other friends who's a photographer there, Donald Morale, I was texting him on the bus and complaining about how long the bus was taking. And he was like, wait, what? You, you're not here for the lighting of the flame? And so, and I didn't realize how much, how all of the cool stuff was at the end. So I missed the 18,000 drones making the globe over the stadium, which would have been the coolest shot ever, especially for me having a drone business. That pissed me off. And then I missed the, the lighting of the flame. So that, those were a lot of stock images you would have got if I wasn't dumb and didn't leave early. <laughs> That's just, you know, here's the thing. I think that everybody, if you take on balance, these things, this is a marathon. When you do an event like this, you're working it, it's a marathon. You're going to have stinkers. We'll call this one a stinker. But yeah. uh, from my opinion, if you guys are out there and you're listening to this and you want to work for Slim Swam or you want to work in, in media, particularly with us, my opinion is you're going to make mistakes. Go ahead and make big mistakes. Go ahead and fail. Um, but I, I was sort of aware of the fact that you must have been just exhausted. And frankly, that wasn't why you were there. You were there to capture swimming. And for and, and anybody who, I mean, that might take it for granted, but you are a legit swimmer, a D1 swimmer. And you know the sport intimately. You care about it. You have personal relationship with the athletes. Um you know, what's when you walked on deck and started shooting, was it was there a level of excitement? Uh, anything that got in you in, in your way professionally? We're like, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. I gotta take a picture. Um, I mean, yeah, the whole time I, I've gotten asked a few times from people if if being a swim fan kind of got in the way a little bit from being a photographer, which it definitely did. Like there were definitely a few moments, especially at the end of races, when I caught myself, you know, just putting my camera to the side and just watching and being excited and have to remind myself now. Um, but I mean, I can still see the action that's going on through the lens and pretty much every good race that there was with some big star, I had goosebumps even while I was shooting. So I think it was the perfect, and I was right there at, at, as close as you can be closer than any fan because we, we were on either side of the blocks. Um, so I was about 10 feet from the pool and, you know, just having those, those big, big moments happening right in front of me was, was awesome. I haven't asked you this. Was your access at the Olympics better than your access on the pool deck at Olympic trials? About 10 times better. Yeah. Uh, your access at the Olympic games was better than us Olympic trials. It's really surprising. Yeah, it was, I mean, there, because the Olympic Games are so much more 
restricted. I think that the access that the people there have is better because there's not, like at Olympic trials, there's a bunch of different photographers trying to get in different spots. Like this one, photographers kind of know where they're gonna go, they have their spot. And the good thing about me is I like being down low, which for some reason is different than a lot of photographers. So like early on, all the other photographers would show up before the session and go straight to the top because we had about five levels and they'd go to the top. Um, and my, my seat in the bottom corner, which has the best view of the finish was always free. Um, so I kind of, I had my spot. I was able to get the shots I wanted, no issue. Um, so it, it was great. It was surprising how great it was. I thought I was going to be put up in the nosebleeds and the stands um, like I have in past meets sometimes. So that, that was a nice surprise. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to have, I was wondering if the experience was going to be better because it was so, uh, because no one was there. That must have been yeah. weird. What's what, I mean, I cannot imagine, I've been to many Olympic games, I can't imagine being there as a competitor or even working in an event without fans. What was that like? At the beginning, I can't lie. It was definitely a little bit disappointing to me cause imagining because I've never been to an Olympics before with fans. So imagining what that arena in Tokyo would have been like packed with fans because it was massive. It was probably about as big as the water cube in Beijing in 08. And so I was just imagining how loud and how deafening the sound would be with people cheering. But at the same time, I think it made for a really unique experience. The teams were doing everything that they possibly could to be as loud as they could. So that they, some teams had drums, some had really annoying horns that everybody knows about. Um, I think it just, it made for a much more intimate environment. Um, like you're at an Olympic games, even though it feels like an exhibition meet, but that just made it for a unique experience. And in 30 years, I'll be able to say I was at the COVID Olympics that didn't have fans, which will be hopefully by then unheard of. I know there are a lot of moments that you love. I know there's, um, but is, is, is there a particular moment, something that, you know, we didn't see on, 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 on television, anything that, that you're like, wow, I'll never forget that. That was special. Um, I mean, my favorite moment of the whole meet, which everyone did see, was the four by 100 medley relay for men. That all of the drama going into that with the night before when they almost didn't even make the final. Um, and watching Team USA and how shocked everybody was during that, and then having them squeak into seventh, they were in lane one. All of us photographers had heard the story that the night before they got in a, in a room and basically said that they were going to break the world record from lane one. So just the, the anticipation going into that and then having it happen and seeing Caleb and Ryan and Michael's reactions after and Zach's when he finished was something that I don't think, I don't know if I'll experience again at anywhere else except another Olympic Games just because of the, the drama that went into it. Um, off camera, I mean, just a lot of the sportsmanship that would happen when the swimmers walked out. So I was right. My position half the time was right where the swimmers would walk over to the media. And before the media, there was a spot where they could FaceTime with their family. Um, so they would have Zooms with family members. And I think the coolest one was after Tatjana's uh, two and a breast world record. She had family on there and her and her, the other swimmer from South Africa, can't remember her name. They went over there and their family was on there and she just put her hand over her mouth, started crying. And, you know, they were all cheering and, it, and I was two feet away from that and got to take pictures of it and experience it, which I think was, was pretty special. No, oh, that's pretty special. There's a lot. We, it's interesting. So, cause we're only, we're an eye peering in. And that's not an experience that you have when you're inside the venue. When you're inside the venue, you're feeling everything. Right. I know that you're that what you do is something that translates everywhere. It's not just swimming. And I know that you wanted to have moments where you covered other sports. Uh, and I was I didn't ask you what you were going to cover, but I was kind of curious. You know, I was just like, I'm going to see what he does because I know it's he's going to put it out there. What 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 are the sports did you attend? And what did you like about them? Yeah, originally my my flight was to leave the, the day the morning after swimming was over. And then when I was there, I was talking to a couple of the guys and they're like, what are you doing? You're at the Olympic Games and you're 23. You have to go shoot other sports. And so I extended my hotel three extra nights. And I, I think I went to, I think I got to 10 different sports. So I was 
I was at gymnastics when Simone Biles um, pulled out. So I was, and that was just the one night I happened to not go to prelims of swimming. And I went to gymnastics just to see Simone Biles and being in that atmosphere with the photographers there. And when she, she did, she wasn't competing. She put her clothes on just the confusion between everybody. And now looking back, thinking of how big of a historical moment that was being 10 feet from Simone. That was awesome. Um, I also went to basketball because I'm a big NBA fan and who knows what else I'll get to see them. I had Kevin Durant fall on me while I was sitting front row, which was cool. Um, and then I also went to track and field, badminton, uh, tennis, and um, table tennis. And one, which they all were awesome. I saw gold medals, but the only thing that I didn't go to that I really wanted to was fencing just because of the level of photos I saw from some people. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm really happy I got to to mix it up and shoot pretty much all of the sports I'd never shot before. And so it was a big learning experience to kind of figure out how to make images that aren't of swimming since I'm so used to it. I saw your images. I thought they were pretty striking. I felt like, you know, uh, imagery is that one thing where you're, it, it's a still shot tells a story. So it's, uh, you know, of, of all of, of all those moments, what was the one moment that you, that you liked the most? Um, I think my, my favorite moment was during badminton when the Indonesian team won gold, won the gold medal. It was the teams just because I've never, even in swimming with all of the reactions we saw, I've never seen two people go as crazy and be as emotional as when these two women won. Um, just the, I've also never knew how crazy badminton was. Like, you know, you've watched on TV and it looks crazy, but in person when they're just whacking that thing back and forth constantly for over an hour, like they just drop their rackets once they won and burst into tears for probably 20 minutes, um, which is special to see. Then that also reminds me of a track when the Italian guy won the high jump. He also, he was holding a, a probably a cast because I think he broke his leg last year um, and it has a cast that said Tokyo 2020 on it. And so he was holding it up, running around, going crazy. So I think just the cumulative reactions from everybody at all the sports, seeing their dreams like come true. Um, that was just in total. That was the best part because you see how much work these people have put in their whole lives. How old are you? I'm 23. 23. You've lived a full life. You've got a, you've got a full life. 23. It's a good start, buddy. The, uh, you know, in, in terms of just looking ahead and, and coming away from this experience, is there, you know, after going through something so, this was a struggle. This was hard. This wasn't easy. This was hard fought to get there, capture the shots. It sounds like it, sounds like it was meaningful. But, you know, what, what's your takeaway? What are you going to carry forward hmm. for your career? Oh, I mean... I think that I learned a lot about how to be unique from one specific selection if we're being technical, because it, the access I had, I still was put in one specific position um, and having Olympic moments happening to the left and right of me all the time, but being stuck in one spot taught me a lot about making images, being creative, working with angles. Um, Cause that's the Olympics and trials to, to a certain extent, but even at trials, I was allowed to go between positions. Like here, we were stuck the entire session. It taught me a lot about being creative and um, just mixing it up a little bit because you don't want all the shots to be the same. But going a little broader than that, I think I appreciate what I do a lot more. Um, being surrounded by, like it's the Olympics for the photographers as well. Being surrounded by the best in the world just kind of taught, it, it humbled me a bit. Um, cause you know, I've been used to going to local meets. I've been to some national things, but being at an event like that was something I've never experienced and kind of just ignited a new, new passion for me for photography that I think I needed because I, you know, I have drone stuff that I do and I have, you know, I have other stuff going on in my life and photography is just one of the things, but being there at the Olympics, making these images, being around these people kind of told me that that's where I need to be and what I need to be doing. Um, 
which is exciting going forward. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.